So this lecture is going to cover chapter 9, uh, the third part, which is on group functioning, specifically talking about process loss, group polarization, and leadership in groups. So to give you a quick overview about what we're going to cover today, we're talking about group processes that impact group functioning, okay? So we're talking about um, the major function of groups being decision-making. And oftentimes we assume that it's better to make a decision um, in a team than just one person making the decision. But is that necessarily true, that two heads are better than one? Well, it depends, right? Um, because oftentimes in a group, you can have what's called process loss, which we're going to dis discuss in detail. You can also have what's called group polarization, um, and we'll talk about that and how groups become polarized. And then thirdly, we'll talk about leadership in groups, and is there one best way to lead, okay? Process loss, any aspect of group interaction that inhibits good problem solving. So this is sort of a catch-all term for any time um, your group is dysfunctional and so you don't, you don't problem solve well together, okay? Um, one reason might be that group, the group may not be trying to find the most expert member of the group that has the most knowledge about uh, the topic, topic they are trying to problem solve on. Another re reason might be normative social pressures that are being felt by the expert in the group. So maybe the expert in the group uh, feels that they're speaking up too much and feels the need to let everyone else speak up um, and so doesn't provide the expertise needed by the group. Also, there could be other communication problems. Um, there might be purely problems in terms of people talking over each other or some people not talking at all or other people dominating the meeting. We've all been in those meetings where someone dominates the meeting or, or the classroom discussion, right? So those are all common group decision-making issues. Then we're going to talk more in detail about failure to share unique information. That's an interesting phenomenon that occurs in groups that we'll discuss. And we'll also talk about groupthink, which several of you know about. So failure to share unique information is a tendency of the group to focus on their shared information and to ignore unique information known only to some members. For instance, like the expert might know more than several other members of the group, um, but the group will end up ignoring that information because it's not shared among the group members. Um, so there was research by Stasser and Titus 1995 that showed that um, when they looked at student body president candidates, um, in order to pick the proper, proper student body candidate, or to pick the best one, um, they needed to not only review their information that they shared as a group, or and also the information that they didn't share as a group. The dependent variables, which candidate was chosen. So um, we see all these people know the same thing about candidate A, these positive facts, um, eight positive facts about candidate A. Um, and then there's four negative facts about candidate A um, that they all know as well. Um, and they all know different things about candidate A, which is the, where the failure to unique share that unique information comes in. So uh, this person knows two positives and four negatives. Uh, this person knows two positives and four negatives. This person knows two positives and four negatives. And this person knows four negatives and two positives. Um, the group decision... Uh, in the upper group where they all know uh, four negative facts and eight positive facts, they decide on candidate A. But uh, in the second group where they all know different things about candidate A, only 24% of them um, decide on candidate A, um, showing this failure to share unique information. They, they knew as a group um, or as individuals, they all knew these different positive facts, but they didn't share them with one another. Um, and because they all knew the same negative facts, then the uh, the candidate, the best candidate, was not chosen. Um, it was only chosen by 24% of uh, 
only 24% chose candidate A. So how do we prevent this failure to share unique information? Well, subsequent research has focused on ways to get groups to focus more on the shared, unshared information. Um, for instance, group discussions should last long enough to get every, beyond what everyone already knows. So figuring out what we, what, okay, so this is the stuff we already know. So what don't we know, right? And getting people to uh, share information that they have that everyone does in the group doesn't have. Um, you can also do things like assign different group members to specific areas of expertise. So, no, so they know that they alone are responsible for certain types of information, right? Um, so that way you make sure that you get all the, all the right information out there. There's something called transactive memory. Um, and that's, this is the idea that the combined memory of two people is more effect, effect, efficient than the memory of either individual. Right. So harnessing that transactive memory will result in better decision making for the group. Another way that process loss occurs um, is this phenomenon known as group think. Now, group, group think is a kind of thinking in which uh, maintaining the cohesiveness of the group and the solidarity felt within the group is more important than considering the facts in a realistic manner. And a great example historically of this is Kennedy and the Bay of Pigs in invasion. Um, so in 1961, uh, Kennedy and his advisors tried to overthrow Castro of Cuba. Uh, you'll probably re recall that Castro was the communist dictator of Cuba forever. Um, so after thinking about it for a long time, Kennedy and his advisor decided how they were going to invade Cuba with 1,400 CIA-trained Cuban exiles. Um, so these people, people that had who were Cuban but who had uh, been ex exiled from Cuban, Cuba. Nearly all the invaders were soon killed or captured. The U.S. was was humiliated, and Cuba then allied itself uh, even closer to the USSR. And so Kennedy, after he learned about the outcome, said, how could we have been so stupid? So let's talk about that. How could they have been so stupid? Well, Kennedy and his advisors were riding high on their close victory in the 1960 election, and they were a very tight-knit, homogenous group. Um, and they had not yet made any major policy decisions, so they lacked well-developed methods for discussing uh, major issues. Um, in addition, Kennedy made it clear that he favored the invasion and he asked the group to consider only details of, about how it should be executed instead of questioning whether it should proceed at all. So they were, again, they were highly cohesive, they were in, isolated from contrary opinions, and they were ruled by a directive leader who made his or her, his or her, his wishes known. So this is, this is when groupthink is most likely to occur. Um, if you think about it in terms of antecedents, symptoms, and defective decision-making that occurs, um, it's easy to see how this happened. Um, okay, for instance, like our, there was an a advisor named Arthur Schlesinger who reported that he had severe doubts about this Bay of, what was called the Bay of Pigs invasion, um, but he didn't express these concerns during the discussions out of fear that others would re regard it as presumptuous of him because he was a college professor to take issue with uh, other heads of major government institutions. Um, and this is where you see that if anyone um, voices a contrary viewpoint, the rest of the group is quick to criticize, pressuring the person to conform to the majority view, right? Um, so that there again, that's where you see that direct pressure on dissenters under uh, symptoms of groupthink. Um, in addition, um, we see it. Schlesinger did share some of his doubts with Dean Rusk, who was the Secretary of State, when Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General and the President's brother, found out about this. He took Schlesinger aside and told him that the president has made his mind up to go ahead with the invasion and that his friends should support him. So um, Schlesinger was quiet and this kind of behavior creates this illusion of unanimity. Again, under symptoms, symptoms of group think, you see that illusion of unanimity. Um, this is the, the illusion that everyone agrees. Um, and you do, this is um, 
done by not calling on people known to disagree. And, ex and it, for example, on the day the group voted on whether to invade or not, President Kennedy asked all those present for their opinion, except for Schlesinger, right? So how do you avoid groupthink trap? How do you avoid the trap of groupthink? Well, in Kennedy's case, um, President Kennedy learned from his mistakes with this Bay of Pigs uh, disaster. And when he encountered his next major foreign policy decision, which was the Cuban Missile Crisis, he took many steps to avoid groupthink. When his advisors met to decide what to do about the discovery of the Soviet missiles in Cuba, Kennedy often was not there uh, when the group met because he didn't want to inhibit the discussion of how they should proceed. He also brought in outside experts uh, who were not members of the in-group to consult with the group. And then there was a success, then he actually was able to successfully negotiate the removal of the Soviet missiles. And this was almost certainly due to these improved methods of group decision making that he had adopted. So he, he took several steps again to recap, to avoid groupthink. <clears throat> he remained impartial. He sought ex ex outside opinions. He created subgroups. He had experts working on different parts of the plan. And he also uh, sought anonymous opinions. So the final form of process loss that we're going to talk about today is called group polarization. And this is the tendency for groups to make decisions that are more extreme uh, than the initial inclinations of its members. Okay. Um, there was research by Myers and Bishop in 1970 um, who studied high schoolers and the researchers surveyed the high schoolers on their racial attitudes. And then they split them into two groups, a high what was considered a highly prejudiced group and a, and a second lowly um, or low prejudice group. Um, and then they had the students discuss or discuss racial in issues in the two groups. Um, and then after the discussion in their respective groups, the researchers measured the racial attitudes and found that those in the, um, those students who were in the high, um, prejudice groups reported even higher prejudices and those in the low prejudice groups reported even lower prejudice than they had previously, right? So this is an example of polarization. Another example that's uh, just a, another way to think about it, not, this is not actual research, this was just um, a way for you to think about polarization. Say if all members of a group were tasting a cookie and then rating it on a scale of one to 10. They may all think the cookie was pretty good and rated it a seven. However, after they rate it, they might talk about it for a while and then rate it again. And then uh, as a great group, they might rate it as a nine. So this is, um, shows that they've, they've become more polarized, that they've all decided that it tastes even better once they talk about it. Or it could go the other way. Um, they might uh, think the cookie was pretty, pretty bad and the average rating might have been a three, but then after they took a talk about it, then they might uh, all decide that it's a one. Um, so again, that's showing that polarization that occurs. So why does this happen? Um, again, let's talk about what it is one more time. A tendency for groups to make decisions that are more extreme than the initial inclinations of its members. Um, so there's actually a process where an individual's attitudes become more extreme um, because of uh, the tendencies of the group. Um, why? Well, we have what's called informational social influence at work, which you guys all remember that. Uh, people are, are seeking information for, from other members of the group. Um, uh, this new information and one-sided arguments from group members that are presented uh, persuade people even more than they were persuaded before. We also have normative social influence at work, right? So people's perceptions of the group norms shift and they are free to express more extreme beliefs, right? Um, so those are two things that contribute to group.
polarization. Now let's shift and start talking about leadership because that's just, it's very interesting and, and it uh, has such a huge effect on group uh, decision making. Um, if you think about Martin Luther King, he was what we considered a transformative or transformational leader, okay? Um, we would like very much just to, to say that he's also a great example of the great person theory. Now this is also a very traditional theory uh, and this is the idea that certain key personality traits make a person a good leader regardless of the situation. But what do we do in social psychology? We always remember that the situation or the context is very important, right? So um, we have to think about the context in terms of leadership as well. So as much we, as we would like to think that it's just a great personality that makes a great leader, personality and leadership abilities are only weakly related in research. Um, compared to non-leaders, leaders tend to be only slightly more intelligent, extroverted, confident, charismatic, right? So these are weak uh, relationships. Surprisingly few personality characteristics correlate strongly with leadership effectiveness, right? So a lot of uh, a lot of leadership theory has looked at uh, leadership styles, right? And this is what I was referring to before when we when I said that MLK was often thought of as a transformational leader. So a transactional leader is leaders who set clear short-term goals and reward people who meet them. So these these uh, these leaders do a good job of making sure the needs of the organization are met and that things are running smoothly. Um, transformational leaders are leaders who inspire followers to focus on common long-term goals. So these are the leaders who think outside the box, who, who identify important long-term goals, and who, and this is a key term here, who inspire their, follow their followers to toil hard to meet goals, right? So inspiration is a big part of being a transformational leader. So again, in social psychology, we, we realize that a leader can be highly successful in some situations, but not in others, because the situation makes such a difference. So we also recognize that a good comprehensive theory of leadership must fo focus on not only the leader himself or herself, but also on the followers and the situation, okay? So the inadequacy of the great person theory does not mean that personal characteristics are irrelevant to good leadership. It just means that being good social psychologists, we should also consider both the nature of the leader and the situation in which the leading is taking place, right? So the contingency theory of leadership is the whole idea that leadership effectiveness depends on how task-oriented or relationship-oriented the, the leader is and also the amount of control and influence the leader has over the group. So there's basically two basic types of leaders according to this theory. The task-oriented leader who is more concerned with getting the job done than with people's feelings, workers' feelings, or relationships. And there's the second basic type, which is the relationship-oriented leader. And this is the leader who's concerned primarily with workers' feelings and relationships as opposed to with just getting the job done. So this theory of leadership has been supported in studies of numerous types of leaders, including business managers, college administrators, military commanders, and strangely enough, postmasters. Um, so, so let's talk about what this theory actually uh, says, okay? Well, it says that task-oriented leaders are most effective in two particular types of situations. That's high control work situations and low control work situations. The high control work situation is where the leader subordinate relationships are excellent. The work is very structured and well-defined as opposed to the low control work situation where the relationships may be poor between the leaders and the subordinates um, and the work being needing to be done is not clearly defined, okay? as opposed to the relationship-oriented leaders, where they're the most effective, according to this theory, is in the, the moderate control work situations. That's where 
the relationships are fairly smooth or the work uh, method is fairly smooth, but some attention needs to be made uh, because there because there may be some relationships that are not perfectly working and there may be some attention to her feelings needed. Okay. So how a way to sort of understand this theory is to uh, see how this graph works. So you look if you look at um, the the y axis leadership performance and you'll see um, leadership performance is high for task oriented leaders when the situational control is either low or high. Um, but leadership performance is high for the relationship oriented leaders when the situational control is moderate. OK, so that's what this theory um, puts forth. So let's talk a little bit about gender and leadership. Why is it difficult for women to achieve leadership positions? Well, there's a widespread belief that good leaders have what are considered agentic traits. Uh, these are things such as dedication, charisma, intelligence, determination, aggressiveness, competitiveness. Well, these are stereotypical male traits. Women are stereotyped as having communal traits being caring, sensitive, honest, understanding, uh, compassionate, sympathetic. So if women behave in ways they are supposed to behave, they aren't perceived as leaders. And this is considered, or, or what we thought, think of as a double bind for women. So this double bind um, is problematic and um, it creates this no-win situation for women. If they're warm and communal, they have a low leadership potential perceived. If they are agentic and forceful, they are often perceived negatively for not acting like a woman should. Um, and you'll see this uh, in, the, in the numbers. In 2016, only 21 of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were women. And the boards of directors of US companies included only 15% women. Um, and we don't see a whole lot of difference in other parts of the world. Um, that 15% figure is actually amongst the highest. Um, there are a few countries with higher rates. Uh, Norway has 47% women um, in boards of directors. Sweden has 34%, France 34%, and Australia 23%. On the low end, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan each have less than 5% of women on boards of directors. So again, if a woman's style of leadership is stereotypically masculine in that she is autocratic, considered bossy, or task-oriented, she is evaluated more negatively than men who have the same leadership style we've seen through research. But we have made advances. We have almost elected a, president, a woman president in 2016, Hillary Clinton, right? But again, she experienced uh, that double bind where people didn't like her because she was considered um, uh, not likable because of her agentic qualities of being very competitive and aggressive, right? So we also see happening with women uh, and leadership is something called the glass cliff. And this is where women are more likely than men to be put in charge of organizations that are in crisis. And this puts them in precarious uh, positions where it's difficult for them to succeed because the risk of failure for any leader in this position is high. Um, so uh, this is problematic uh, as well, this whole notion of a glass cliff. Um, the good news is that the widespread prejudice against women as leaders is lessening over time. Some examples of uh, female CEOs that have experienced this glass cliff, GM's first female CEO, Mary Barra, is considered uh, as by Bloomberg as one who was able to withstand the glass cliff and she's considered amazingly uh, successful uh, in her leadership of GM. Um, where she, an example of where she dealt with um, being on the glass cliff in 2014, um, she had to announce plans for GM to recall over 11 million cars due to defective design components. Even though the company had already known about these for, for nearly 10 years, she was forced to actually deal with it in the public. Um, and she, um, she successfully negotiated this 
recall, and she's been very successful since then. Um, so she's considered a breaker of glass. And here's a link to an article here, um, which is, uh, sort of talks about the whole notion of the glass cliff for female leaders. Lastly, I want to mention just uh, a little bit of research that's been done looking at culture and leadership. Um, uh, there was a huge study done by House et al. in 2004 um, where they surveyed um, 17,000 managers in 951 organizations in 62 different countries on leadership practices and valuable traits of leaders. Um, there was uh, some great universal agreement found about the value of two leadership qualities specifically, charisma and team orientation. Um, there was also additionally some cultural differences in leadership found uh, that were not surprising due to um, uh, different types of uh, values of leaders in different countries. But the biggest finding was the, uh, that the, you know, of the two universal uh, similarities of valued leadership, charisma, and team orientation. All right, that wraps it up for this section of uh, Chapter 9.